we all know who he is. But I'll tell you a few things, and then I'll add a few, and then it will be his, his program. I know we can forget the images of the devastation on the Gulf Coast left by Hurricane Katrina in August 2005. When it seemed that desperation and chaos were taking over the city of New Orleans, one man stepped in to take charge and store order and hope, and that was General Russell Allred. Now, I will tell you this. I grew up there, in case you can't catch the accent. Uh, I was one of those people because my whole family had and others and dogs and cats, and we all were watching television. My dad was waiting to go home. He wanted to go home. That's all he wanted. And then when the city started to fill up, all the plans changed. As we all know, the history is the history. And I can remember my father saying many times, somebody needs to do something. Somebody just needs to do something. And someone did. Uh, and that was a discussion, too, for the entire family. Of, it's not necessarily Superman. And I'm not saying he's not but it's someone who's willing to do something that becomes a hero. And I, I personally, because of my family and the effect it had on, on our, our, all of us, I'm personally appreciative. And, I, and, and as soon as Les told me there was a willingness for the general to come, I basically took the position that I don't care what he talks about. <laughs> I want him to come, because he is a special person. And we're fortunate to have him. Let's look at uh, a video for a couple of minutes. Uh, and to bring everybody up to speed as a good teacher. Yes, so we'll see why. Being established, the deal with Katrina, who, who will be in charge? Who will run this operation? A one-star, a two-star, a three-star, or a four-star general? Our understanding at this point, Wolf, and the announcement is not officially out yet, is it will be a three-star or the general will be... This is a conflict problem. Is called a disaster. <laughs> of a disaster. Friday, September 2nd, four days after Katrina hit, the cavalry has arrived. Hey, weapons down! Weapons down, man! Weapons down! Uh, all I have to say this morning is that hooray for honore. This guy uh, seems to be the perfect guy for this job. Seeing him in the streets of New Orleans. Tell them to put their M16s down for gosh sakes. And you know, just, you know, let's get some tension out of here. Let a little steam off, please. You know, you saw Honore yesterday doing really sort of almost symbolic things, but uh, at one point, Barbara Arbor Star, who was uh, right along there with him, a witness can come up to a mother who had twin uh, babies and she was struggling to even hold on to the baby. He took the babies out of her arms, uh, gave them to his soldiers, and arranged for them to immediately be met back uh, to a ship offshore. Now, that's just one person, but what it, it sends a message that they understand uh, the problem. Of course, the whole, his whole point about having the soldiers put their guns down, uh, to again, reinforce that they're here to help. They're not here to, uh, you know, intimidate people. Well, I'll tell you where blame doesn't lie, and that's where the straight shoot and take charge. John Wayne, dude, who never got stuck on stupid, who's exactly what the Gulf Coast needed right after Hurricane Katrina. Don't get stuck on stupid, reporter. That's BS. I will take that on behalf of every first responder down there. It's BS. That's right. We'll never forget General Russell Henry's one-liners, but we'll remember what he did for the hurricane victims even more. When President Bush assigned this Louisiana-born general to command and joint task force Katrina, Henry knew this would be one of the most difficult missions in his career, but he was ready, and he became an overnight hero. Yeah. The general that I have the, the, the real honor to introduce, because I do like this line too, uh, at least by one mayor, I think by more than that during, during the course of all of this, was referred to as uh, one John Wayne dude. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask you right now to join me in, in welcoming General Honore to the Louisiana Federation of Teachers 49th Convention. Thank you, General.
turn my tape recorder over back on. I want to make sure we record it. I've never heard so many glowing and fabulous comments about politicians before in my life. <laughs> I thought I was at a lawyer's convention. <laughs> tell you this, Louisiana got a hell of a lot more to offer than duck calls. <laughs> and I love the Robinsons, I love what they do, but it's just a tip of what you're producing, our teachers, that we got to offer to this nation, because there is a fascination of what's going on in Louisiana, because we're different. We're different only from the perspective that we're a unique, blended culture that the rest of the nation don't understand. And just last year, 200 years ago, uh, Julius Potter from Point to Peak Parish, home of the first public school in Louisiana. And oh, by the way, I'm a graduate of the Louisiana public school system. And damn I'm proud of it. Uh, rode a horse from Point to Peak Parish to Washington, D.C. Uh, on a horse to petition our uh, inclusion into these great United States. And on arrival, he was uh, greeted with a cold hand because there were some folks from up north who said, hey, we're not quite sure if we want Louisiana in the United States because y'all don't speak English. <laughs> and as some of you know, we still struggle with that. <laughs> Today, the young folks would call that our brand. It's a part of our brand. But when he put that argument on, he took on much of the Congress at the time. Because one of the things they said was, you don't have enough people. And lo and behold, a little revolution down on Haiti and Santo Domingo brought us 10,000 citizens. And we became a part of the United States of America. And let us remember today, Louisiana, we are a part of the United States of America. <laughs> There are things that are different, but we've got more things that assemble ourselves as a part of this great nation than divide us from the rest of the nation. I'm here today to talk to you about leadership. That's what I signed up to talk about, the price of leadership. Because I think the mission you have, the mission you've talked about that is embedded in what you are doing and what you've talked about and what I've heard here today is one of education. Probably the most uh, important thing any generation can do is educate the next generation to be competitive. And there's a lot of talk about education. There's a lot of emotion around education. So I apologize to you teachers because you get a hell of a lot of help. <laughs> but there's more help that uh, Kimberly brought to you and this organization is one of them that uh, not just talk and act. So it's an honor to be here today to talk to you about leadership. If you don't mind, I'm going to leave from this preacher position and get down here and <laughs> walk around a little bit. <laughs> because if one thing I learned in the infantry, a moving target is hard to hit. <laughs> this challenge of leadership that we are faced with today uh, we grew up, uh, most of us uh, in this room, learning that leadership was the art and science of influence people to accomplish a task or a mission. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to propose to you just a little bit different twist to that that I've got in this book out there, Leadership in a New Normal. And that is, leadership is the art and science of influencing other people to willingly follow you to accomplish a mission. As I told you, I'm a student and a graduate of Louisiana Public Schools. So what I didn't tell you, I was a C student. I served uh, five continents and six states, and uh, my last command had a half a million troops in it uh, throughout the United States of America. Because when I grew up, I may not have been able to do all the algebra, but I remember something the teacher said. It's not by where you started, where you end. Wow. 
That success is not in getting there, it's the journey. And that if you get an education, you can do anything you want. And when I showed up at Southern University, I took preparation courses. And some of them I took twice, to include swimming. <laughs> because my college professor felt a, a Clark, who was the president of Southern University at the time, I had gone in to be an agriculture teacher, a certified teacher in the state of Louisiana. I was going to teach agriculture and be a county agent. He said, if you're going to teach in Louisiana, you need to know how to swim. Because every summer, dozens of young people in Louisiana would die from not knowing how to swim. Many of them rural areas. So I tell people that story. I say, well, my president said we got a mandatory elective. And the people from Yale and Harvard I talked to and Boston College and all the other toothpaste schools, they said, well, <laughs> what's a mandatory elective? I said, it's called leadership. He said, if you're going to be a teacher in Louisiana, you need to know how to swim so you can teach kids how to swim. Because at that time, there were no pools for poor we rural kids to learn how to swim. They'd go throw them in the bayou. That's how so many of them would die every summer, just like we had Shreveport here a few years ago. Mandatory elective. And the guy said, well, what is a mandatory elective? I said, well, at the time, I didn't appreciate it. But as I've grown older, I understand a mandatory elective is called leadership. Getting people to do what they don't want to do. Because leadership is not about doing what's popular. Leadership is about performance. And after I took that course twice, I got my teacher's degree and left Southern University and went to Army for 37 years, three months, and three days. <laughs> leadership, getting people to do what they don't want to do and getting them to do it willingly. I'm going to use an example today from our forefathers. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, little view graph here is a picture of our founding fathers uh, in a battle against the British Army. And they're fighting for the survival of the nation. Uh, General Washington, you can see at the front of the boat, leading his men. Uh, one thing about a leader, and General Washington, you could always find him out front. In this case, he's on the front of the boat, or he'd be riding the white horse. And actually, the name of that horse, name is Nelson. Nelson's going to come into this story a little later on, because you got to figure out when you saddle up Nelson. <laughs> uh, these men are not properly equipped. Most of them can't read. They find the most powerful army in the world. I'm putting this in context because we think we got it hard today. They had it hard. They fought in America, not on a foreign soil. So when the British Army came around, they could tell who was all fighting. And they would tear those farms and businesses up as they do the men war. We think we got it hard today. This army that General Washington had they didn't have proper equipment. Not all of them had full magazines or, or weapons, proper rifles that worked, taking on the most powerful army in the world. They didn't have boats. Where do you think you get the boats from? Well, they practiced the old Louisiana uh, supply system called TOPS. Anybody know what TOPS is? Take other people's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Normally that S is something else as I hold that poor boat. <laughs> Actually, they left a little note said, we're going to borrow your boat, we're going to save the country tonight. Look at the bit of cold weather. Ladies and gentlemen, on the other side of getting something done called sacrifice. You're not going to get something done talking about I believe in that. You're going to get something done by doing stuff. And if you're not willing to use your human capital, stay home. Don't even show up. Because if you're not putting your own reputation on the line, what you're doing ain't hard enough. You think about what these men did to win our freedom. 
If it ain't hard, stay home. Because you're not ready to leave. Human capital, put it on the line. Physical presence, put it on. It's cold. It's Christmas. These troops that Washington has, they come from our militia, Terran Bay National Guard. Any National Guard members here? How about a round of applause for our National Guard? Here? The others are from the uh, regular army. Uh, these troops have signed up for one year. On the eve of this battle, they got five days left on the enlistment. And they're going home. Now you think about some of those little self-centered kids, some of you got off of college right now. <laughs> they're yours. You raised them little suckers. I didn't know. <laughs> you talk to them every day. <laughs> and you call them up and say, hey, you know, uh, we got something to do here. What? It's five, it's, it's five days. It's the evening before Christmas. You want me to sacrifice something? Hello. They got five days left on the enlistment, then they're going home. If they got injured, there was no hospitals. There was no ER room. There was no plasma to give them blood. 90% of them were missing on the eve of this battle from being AWOL and from sick from the bitter cold. Yeah, we put this in context because actually a lot of us think we got it real hard today. We got to put it in perspective. And not all was fair. I was giving this speech over at my alma mater, Southern University, and a young uh, ROTC cadet said, uh, Well, General, something missing. Yes, I know what's missing. 20% of them were black, and they were slaves. They were not free themselves, but they were fighting for freedom, a promise that had been given to us in the Declaration of Independence, which was six months old before this battle took place. The Declaration of Independence, that promise that we're all equal and we're all free, ladies and gentlemen, is still the most powerful document ever written by a man. The most powerful document ever written by a man. The words of the Declaration of Independence were so powerful, King George III asked the people of England to pray that the words of the Declaration of Independence would never come to fruition, for he knew it would be the end of his form of government. And you know, about three months ago, we got that little baby born over there. And I said, please don't call that little sucker George. <laughs> what they call it? George. <laughs> we got another George on our head. Watch it, he might be coming back. You never know. <laughs> Declaration of Independence. You see, historians have studied for a long time why we won. Again, it goes back to the power of that word freedom. One of the challenges of a leader is to get people focused and going in the same direction. A leader loves to unite, not to divide. A leader wants everybody on the team. And sometimes that requires some compromise. Remember, change is hard. That's why people don't want to do it. Cross your arms. Cross your arms right now. Order. Cross your arms. Cross your arms. Everybody cross your arms. Order. Now you feel good? Yeah. Now reverse it. Reverse it. How'd that feel? Don't feel quite as good, does it? See right here. You human too. We don't like change. It's not just them, it's us. Leaders understand that. And they understand that cause good change will call for somebody to sacrifice. This army under General Washington, he understood that. He understood it was going to take sacrifice to win our freedom from the British. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the price of leadership. Sacrifice. It's about performance. It's not about popularity. It's about working as a team. It's about getting everybody focused. Make sure they understand the priority. And the priority there was freedom. Even when everybody in his army will not free themselves. That is one of the challenges we have today 
in this ever-expanding world that we live in called America. There's 7 billion people in the world. 10 years ago, we had about 5.8 billion. Of the 7 billion people in the world, about 3 billion live on less than $4 a day. How many of you, let alone your kids, have glued through $4 before you even got here this morning? And some of your kids at some of these schools, they're going in there ordering them coffee, so can't they like that type of duty? <laughs> I'll buy their coffee, but I ain't speaking the language. You know, right? Four dollars. Live on less than four dollars a day. Of that seven billion people, nearly three billion can't do this and turn lights on in their house. Another two and a half million can't do this to turn water on in the house. The kids you are educating are going to have to compete in that environment. You see, because we are 5% of the world's population, we consume 25% of the world's resources. What does that mean to the kids you are training or educating? They're going to have to compete in that world. We can't defeat everybody. We've got the world's seventh largest army. Even though we spend more money collectively than the rest of the world doing on defense. And we ought to be proud of that. That's one lift we want to be on the top of. But ladies and gentlemen, all these challenges of this ever-expanding population brings on opportunity. Remember now and then in Louisiana we get something called hurricane, right? And up here in north, north Louisiana, y'all get ice storms. I make sure I get out of here before the damn ice storm comes out. <laughs> Speaking of that. See, that's why I'll never be a damn politician, because I'm going to tell you, just like it is. <laughs> In Louisiana, we have these big hurricanes come through. And the last big one, Gustav put the lights out, and I think the 32 parishes. So, well, one of those kids you are educating right now uh, go to college and come out on the other side of college with an invention. It could be a little box, maybe the size of this podium, that you pick up at some big box store, invented by a kid from Louisiana, that you pick it, take it home, take it in the closet, plug it up, and if the power goes out, you'll run your house for five days. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the children you're raising today are the ones who have to solve that problem. You see, because when they solve that problem for our convenience in America, they'll solve that problem for three billion people in the world. There are people tonight <laughs> that will kill a chicken and they got to eat it all at night. Because if they don't, they'll spoil by the morning. We'll solve that problem. Because our power grid, be that what it is, is very fragile. It is what it is. Until somebody comes up with something new. They've got to take on the impossible. You see, when I talk to these students from Louisiana to every other state in the country, when I go around to the university, they say, well, General, that's impossible. You can't do that. Plug that thing in. I say, it's only impossible, son, because it hasn't been done yet. <laughs> the future is on the other side of impossible. I want you to think about everything we're dealing with today that people say that are impossible is the future that they're going to have to deal with. They're going to have to solve that problem. Because you see, we have put a vehicle the size of a Ford 150 on the moon, and it's running around up there now. But we haven't developed a damn transformer that a damn squirrel can't trip. <laughs> we can be sitting in there right now. Place, you know, uh, Duck Dynasty, said, well, a squirrel would be hanging around there, bam, knock the power out. <laughs> right, Charles, so what's the problem? I don't know. Wait till the guy come and look at the pole, you see a little tail looking at, oh, there he is. Oops. Here's the thing, lights come back home. That's the inconvenience for us. But when we solve that problem for America, we're going to solve that problem for three billion people. The, the children you're raising today, you have to solve them problems. <coughs> you have to solve the problem because I believe, as I said in the new norm, 
I think the next war will be over water. It won't be over oil. It's going to be over water. We're challenged not here in Louisiana, just in Louisiana, but one of the reasons the great Supreme Court of the United States was formed was to solve disputes between the states over water. When it goes around, come around. As the population continues to grow, we're going to be challenged by water. We got to got to create that technology to help us solve some of the problems. Right now, at the end of the Gulf of Mexico, when the Mississippi River go out in this great big place, we got an 800 square mile dead zone. How to get there? Everybody, I don't know. It ain't my fault. Nobody knows nothing. Uh, but we do know one thing. There is some science involved with it. It's not magic. It's for overinduction of protein in the Mississippi River. And the 31 uh, states that dump stuff in the Mississippi River. Not all intentional. It's a function of, of uh, what we do and a function of our economy. Our kids, one of them is going to have to figure out a way how we clean that water. See, a lot of that water is coming from the south end of corn farms and pig farms and chicken farms. All the stuff we like to eat, which has a priority in my life, too. But we can put a solution there. One of them kids you will graduate next year might be the one that will develop a machine that can set at the south end of a pig farm and clean that water. Because if that water gets into the river, guess what happens? You put protein in the river, and it goes out and causes big algae bloom. And the algae bloom several feet thick. And when it dies, it settles to the bottom and kills all the microorganisms. And when that happens, it creates a dead zone. These are the challenge of the children that you're raising today. They don't have to solve their problems, ladies and gentlemen. So we have to get them ready to solve those problems. That's the challenges we face. We got to get these kids to think about creating a brilliant airplane. So well, why would that be, General? So, well, let me just explain three things to you about leadership. I'll come back to that point. A public school teacher told me when I was leaving New Road to Louisiana. She said, son, you know, Rush, you're not the smartest uh, or the sharpest knife in the basket there, boy. <laughs> I said, well, I understand that. She said, well, I'm going to give you a couple of things for you to take with you. She said, learn to do the routine things well. Do the routine things well. Have you ever been in the presence of a teacher that does the routine things well? It's a joy. Have you ever been in the presence of a boss that do the routine things well? On the other hand, have you ever been in the presence of a teacher or a boss that just makes stuff up when they go? Huh? Do the routine things well. The second thing she told me was that point we will come back and talk about the impossible. She said, don't be afraid to take on the impossible. Because there'll be the things that you will do will be on the other side of impossible. And this is old public school teacher. You know. Public school teacher. <laughs> old public school teacher. <laughs> Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. And when I flew into New Orleans on that Navy helicopter of the USS Baton as the commander of Joint Task Force Katrina, I've been in the Army 35 years. And that, that thought had never come to me because I handled what had been given to me. To include everything from a platoon of 30 infantrymen to an uh, army of 500,000 troops. Not a problem. But here, driving into New Orleans, that thought came back to me. I said, this looks impossible. They said, no, it ain't. We can fix this, too. Because we've got to get the people out here and take the water out of the city. That thought came back. The third point she told me, she said, Russ, don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. In today's world, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not taking a little criticism, you ain't doing enough. Again, leadership is not about popularity. It's about performance. And we don't need to be a born contrarian. But we need to understand that it's not all the ways of popularity. But don't be afraid to act even if you're being criticized. Back to that point that was challenging about don't be afraid to take on the impossible. 
Think about if we, you were to train a student to go off to the university. You know, by the way, I was a C student. The, the number one student in my class at Rosenwald High School had a four point something something. Stanford University found her. They striked her. She went off to be a PhD. World round renowned researcher in, in science. The smartest uh, young man in my class, I said, we're going to Southern together, right? He said, oh, no. I don't have no money. I said, well, I don't have no money either. Let's go together. He said, oh, no. I said, let's go together. He was literally, he was a uh, genius. He wouldn't go to college. And he did well. He was a barber. He did what he wanted to do. And he was pretty successful at it. So again, leadership. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. Because going, being dropped off at Southern University on the back of what we call old cow trucks, with some clothes and a bag, and uh, $25 in my pocket, and being reminded of the fact, make us proud, boy. We want you to graduate. We want you to graduate. Make us proud. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. I've been empowered by that public school teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, we must continue to be empowered. Don't be afraid to take on the impossible. We must inspire for these children that the on success is on the other side of impossible. Look, subsistence farm, 12 kids in the family. It's not just about being poor. It should not define you. What should define you is that spirit in your heart that's built into you that tells you it's not about being poor, it's about being raising yourself out of poverty. Because in one generation, I went from poverty to prosperity. You see, when we challenge these kids to take on the impossible, they need to understand that maybe one of them will create a smart airplane. We say, my what would be a smart airplane? Well, that's one, because one of them has taught the computer how to taste and smell. May I use your machine there for a minute now? Now think about this. If one of them little whoop snappers that you're training right now, educating right now, was to create a computer that could taste and smell. We had a man who got killed 50 years last year. He challenged the world to do something that hadn't been done. Remember that challenge? You heard that speech last week. And everybody said, well, yeah, you do. We got to challenge ourselves to do what hasn't been done. See, when you teach a computer how to taste and smell, you can take an app and put it on something like this. You go in your refrigerator, and you take that old Buddha in your ball and laugh. See? <laughs> and I say, hey, don't eat this, it'll kill you. <laughs> Get ready to put it down on the couch. Oh no, that's salmonella there. Don't put me down there. <laughs> it's possible. See, ladies and, in the, ladies and gentlemen, the new normal, we have to deal with that food security. We have to deal with uh, transportation security. Uh, think about an airplane coming into uh, Shreveport from somewhere around the world. An hour out before landing, the computer tells the pilot that the person set in seat F-22 has a fever. And as it slows down, coming in the street forward, uh, I said, here, not only does F-22 have a fever, 10 more people have a fever. Because what happens if they get off that plane and go into the casinos in street forward? What's going to happen? I mean, all over the state and God knows how many other places they'll end up. Again, Land the airplane, get ready to land the airplane. FAA said, don't land in Shreveport. Uh, take that plane to Baton Rouge. Plane lands in Baton Rouge. Flight attendants give everybody a little stick. This is not invented yet either. Put it in your mouth. If you come out green, you get off the plane. And if you come out red, you stay on the plane and we ship you to Utah. <laughs> For further analysis. <laughs> no. 
none of this is invented yet. And when I talk to the students about it, I say, oh, oh, I said, Papa, it just hasn't been done yet. I said, look, kids, look, it's just a little over 109 years ago when two old boys who used to make bicycles got some stick, got some of their mama's tablecloth, tied them together, jumped off a damn cliff and created what? Yeah. And when they did it, what did people say? Look at them old boys. If God wanted us to fly, you what? The other the wing. <laughs> and then there was religious connotations to it. Look at them boys. They're going to fool around and mess their hair up. They're going to make God mad. <laughs> God wanted us to fly and give us wing. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenge you have as teachers is how do we inspire the children that you have? In spite of what we might say are the problems, and they're not nearly the problems that these first Americans had in winning our freedom. And at the end of the day, that they know that you are preparing them for the challenges of the future. It is not about the quality of the walls in your school. Because I spent two years in a Baptist church, the first two years, first and second grade, being taught together. And you can see out the side of the St. Alma AME Baptist Church. Was it fair? No. There's a school a mile from the house, a brick school. Went to school in that St. Alma Elementary School. And then from there, went into the little uh, eight-room elementary school. And then from there, got bused an hour and 20 minutes every day when there was a school a mile from my house. It had nothing to do with about any of that. It has nothing to do with my brick and mortar. It has to do about building character and taking on challenges. Is the world fair? Hell no, the world ain't fair. We've got to teach these kids that they can't give up, that they got to learn how to read, that they got to learn how to write, and they got to learn how to do their arithmetic. <clears throat> and I still don't give a damn what X means. <laughs> I had $500 men and a $5 billion budget, not counting personnel. That was just the stuff we bought. And nobody had ever asked me to figure out what X or Y meant. <laughs> I really never gave a damn. <laughs> Somebody had to do that. You're right. But it may not be the leftist test for every kid that predestines their, their the rest of their life. How do we get these kids involved? There are things that are going around that we somehow uh, have come to accept. When we picked those babies up on the streets of New Orleans on Friday afternoon, Katrina hit Monday. Mama is 18 years old. She's a high school dropout. There's two little beautiful black boys had blood coming out of their nose. They were dehydrated. Behind her was a young lady with a little girl, about nine months old. We took those babies and we took them over to a Coast Guard cutter. And those Coast Guard uh, seamen rehydrated those babies. And we brought a helicopter in, picked those babies up, and gave them a million dollar ride to Baton Rouge, to safety. The thing that really pissed me off was, where was those baby daddies? Oh, my God. We can't not talk around that problem. Because those little babies, those little babies come from somewhere. Where were those baby daddies? Because, see, those babies, according to the Children's Defense Fund, those babies would not get a fair break in life. They have a 50% chance of having 
or run in with the law by the time they're 14 years old. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to figure out how we're going to fix that. Again, it's not just about the brick and mortar or the address of the school. It's about a cultural shift we've got to go in and have a dialogue in our community. Because those little boys, they ought to have a fair shot. But we're working on them too. And we got an address for them. And that's going to be an honorary center at Southern University in New Orleans, thanks to our legislators. Thank you all very much. we got to figure out how we're going to deal with that. Because it's things that's going on beyond brick and mortar, beyond curriculum. It's how we're going to get that community engagement. But those kids understand that there's a choice, that they don't become disengaged. There are studies that are being done that's documented by the Children's Defense Fund that there are cities that are studying the reach level of 10-year-old males in the fourth grade to look at their reading level. Because those are below reading level is an indication of how many prisons we need in 20 years. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a damn shame. I talked to a prominent leader here in the state who's been in politics a long time. He said, well, we just built more prisons. I said, well, how is that working out for us, buddy? <laughs> the United States lead the nation, lead the world, and people in prison, and we lead the nation. How is that working out for us? Ladies and gentlemen, the enduring problem in Louisiana, that, and you deal with it every day, is poverty. Yes. And until we take on this issue of poverty in Louisiana, we will never raise up to be the state that we can be. Yes. There are pockets of poverty in Louisiana that are embarrassing. Yes. It ought to be a damn shame with the natural resources we got to be at the bottom of the economic ladder of this nation. There's something systemically wrong here. And it's got to be fixed. And what made me mad is that we got a generation of kids in college today that should be leading us to change, and they're silent. They're like sheep. Because they don't want to disturb the fact that they got their new car and they go to get to go to college for free. They should be champions of these causes, just like you were champions of the last generation that brought us to where we are today as a nation. We've got to change. Because what we're doing is not working. And don't get too high up about this thing about federal government and federal standards. Remember, Julius Partners fought so we could be a part of that federal standard. He rode a horse to Washington, D.C so we could be a part of the federal nation. There's a reason states don't get to do everything they want to do. Imagine if every state governor decided how an airplane was to be flown and how an airport would be run. You had the boys over in Texas say, well, we like to land east or west. <laughs> but we Texans. You understand? Guy in Louisiana said, well, we like to go. North South. So regardless of what the weather is, this is the way we do it in Louisiana. There's a reason we got federal standards. We would not be sitting here today if we didn't have federal standards as an integrated group. There's a reason we got federal standards. Not everything federal is bad. We've got to understand that we are living with a lot of regulation in Louisiana. These kids that we're teaching, the poor kids we're teaching got a 20-year deficit on their life. Kids you got in high school right now from poor communities got a 20-year deficit on their life because they're poor and they're in Louisiana. We got to fix that. And it's up to you, us, this community, this leadership, this challenge, I love to see the fire that's in this room and the legislators that are here today that stand up and talk about education and talk about every kid should have an opportunity 
about good education. Remember, you don't see everybody on that boat. I had the opportunity to go up to Angola uh, two years ago to receive an award. And they took us out on the levee. And I passed over an okra field, about 15 acre of okra. And all I could see in that okra were little heads sticking out the top of that okra. And I said, look at the human capital that's being wasted right here. Man, those kids are in there because they became disengaged from education. They didn't learn how to read, and they ended up in a contraband economy on the street. I'm telling you, our priority has to be education. The rest of these things will come in line as far as our economy, and as far as our tax base. We've got to support education. The obvious thing is breaking borders. The obvious thing is how we pay our teachers a fair, fair uh, wage. I heard some guy this morning on a New Orleans station say, yeah, but we train kids, they come out of Louisiana High School, and they go make $90,000 a year in the uh, oil business. Well, that's good news. How much did teacher make that taught them to go do that? <laughs> And oh, by the way, that all comes to probably get the damn tax break. Oh. I'm going to make you very uncomfortable in the coming year, my fellow citizens, about our environment. Because we've got to save our water in Louisiana. And we've got to get rid of Kansas Alley. We've got to save. We want these companies, but we don't want you to come trash our place. We've got to keep it clean. We've got over 6,000 abandoned oil wells in Louisiana that's putting oil out into our swamps and into our wetlands and into our farms every day. 6,000. We've got to close those oil wells. Ladies and gentlemen, that's going to take leadership. But those kids that you're training today in the Louisiana public school system, they are blessed to be coming into a place where the economy has continued to grow. They want to be a part of that. How are we going to make them a part of that economy and not a part of Angola? Amen, amen. That's the question. We got to teach them how to read. If they can't read, they're going to quit. In my own mind, it's fresh. In my mind, who stopped coming to school after the eighth grade? It was the kids that couldn't read. It's got to be a priority. If we got to put two teachers in every room, let's do it. It's still cheaper. It's cheaper to keep them in prison. It's cheaper to put two teachers in every classroom, or even three in every classroom, <coughs> to make sure all those kids learn how to read than it is to keep that kid in Angola for a year. That's the challenge. Now this is, you might say, well, we just came up here for a union meeting. <laughs> you know, uh, my job is to talk about leadership is to challenge you that we got to change. Because doing the same thing over and over, we're going to end up with the same results. And we've got to have transparency. We need to put in the paper where we are on incarceration. We need to put in the paper on... Uh, how much money we're getting from these oil and gas companies. Yeah. We need to talk about facts like, we got some parish, show me where the poorest education, I'll show you where they have the poorest tax base. No. Where 20% of the people own 80% of the land. Yes. And none of their kids are in the public school system. Right. So how in the hell do you think the public school is going to be? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you got a challenge on your hand. But I know you have to because you're teachers. Teachers don't quit. Teachers are real. You chose to be a teacher not just because it was popular or that you could uh, get super rich doing it. You took on a vocation. People who take on a vocation are committed to that vocation. You have not ended up in this room today just because you had nothing on your calendar today. 
You sacrifice your time to come here and to represent your group. I'm proud to be Louisiana. I'm proud to be a part of the public school system. I hope and I pray that we will get that focus, not just in terms of some fad about education, but that we really will concentrate on reading, writing, and arithmetic. That education in Louisiana can't be just about kids who get to go to college for free. Matter of fact, I don't think much of that, because I went to college, I didn't have no money. I took a loan to pay for my own damn college. I got kids in my neighborhood living in million dollar houses, riding a BMW to LSU and the Southern, and don't pay their way into college. That's a damn shame. And we can't afford what we need to do to build up elementary and, and high schools in Louisiana. That's a shame. That's a dichotomy. We got to change that. And we got to talk about it. And when I talk to leaders about that, I talk to a friend of mine standing out on his estate. And I say, well, you know, guys like you, you shouldn't be able to send your kids to school on top. He say, oh, don't say that. I said, what that's going to mean? You get a Cadillac every other year that's supposed to every year? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to focus on those kids that's not learning how to read. That's the challenge. We've got to take on the impossible. And if we don't talk about it, it's not going to change. We live in a great state with a lot of natural resources. How do we use those resources to have the best resource education system in America? How in the hell can Mississippi have better schools than us? Oh, Arkansas. Arkansas is rated number five like three years ago. How could that be? They don't even have no oil. As a matter of fact, I don't know what the hell Arkansas got. <laughs> How could that be? Oh, they got Walmart somebody said. <laughs> How could they have a better education system than now? That can't be right. Well, they might have lied, but anyhow. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, uh, I thank you for being a graduate of Louisiana School System, but we we're going to have to start talking about, in Louisiana, the unspeakable. One of the things about leadership is we've got to talk about not just what's popular. We've got to talk the reality of the day that unless we're able to do something about this poverty in our state, those kids will not come to school ready to learn. They will not come from an environment because their parents are not working because there's no work there. But when I go down Highway 30, where they're putting all those plants, I'm being run over by trucks from Texas and Mississippi and Alabama. And we got people right here in our state not working. We got to prepare that workforce. But what's going to prove to be a big boom in our economy? They got to learn how to read. They got to learn how to write. They got to learn how to do arithmetic. And if those kids can perform at the eighth grade level and go on to high school, and figure out what college they want to go to or what they want to do as adults, you will have succeeded in the education system. And I want to thank you and the public school teachers that taught me for giving me the opportunity. Because, as I said, I came from a very different but challenged school system. But the teachers challenged us because we were connected to the teachers. I went to one of them, uh, what do you call them, schools that one of them created school, one of them what happened now school, uh, up Point of P Parish. They asked me to come there and speak. I, I went to the school, got out of my car, walked, and I see a Cadillac park in the breezeway. In all my life, I never see a teacher park their car in the breezeway. I went in and gave the speech, and I'm walking out, and the principal said, uh, any help you can give me in staying on here? It was one of them, what you call, uh, charter school. <laughs> And I said, what do you mean help you stay? He said, well, I'm the fourth principal in five years. When I went to school, I had one principal. So I'm standing in there, and here's this Miss Thing walk up with a Chico dress out on and about a, a, a $30,000 ring. She's the CEO of some company running this charter school. So on the way back out to my car, I said, who's this car for? I've never seen this in a school before. Well, a car is parked on the breezeway. 
Boy, that's the CEO of our charter school company. What in the hell is going on with that? Where well, did you get this bullshit from? Yeah, play the song, put the song out.